it's time for the reading of the scripture. I'm going to invite you to turn first in your Bibles or on your devices to Proverbs chapter 3. We've already heard this a little bit, but, you know, it's the Bible, so it's good to hear it again. So Proverbs chapter 3, so we'll start, but let's ask uh, for God's help. Let's ask his Holy Spirit to be with us because it's, not a, it's important not just to hear these words with our ears or see them with our eyes. It's important to receive them into our hearts, right? To, to, to make them part of us so that we will do them and live them out. Let's pray and ask for God's help. Holy Spirit, please draw us close to you. And as we hear the scriptures read today, and as we receive your word proclaimed to us today, let your word of faith, your word of faith, be on our lips and in our hearts. And let all those other words that clamor for our, our attention slip away. May there be today only one voice that we hear, your voice of truth and grace. Amen. So from Proverbs chapter 3, now Proverbs is a book of wisdom. It's actually called, there's a group of books in the Bible that are called the wisdom books. Proverbs is one of them. And Proverbs represents to us a picture of how God's people might live lives that are aligned with God's perspective on the world. We've talked about that. Wisdom is agreeing with how God sees things. Now in this portion of Proverbs, the teacher is exhorting young people to forsake the foolishness of living without God, without regard to God, but rather to live lives that are characterized by God's wisdom. Let's hear what God has to say. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Now, if you turn to Paul's letter to the Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 1, we'll read verses 3 through 11. Now, this letter of Paul's was written to the Jesus community in the Roman colony city of Philippi, hence the name Philippians, right? And Paul had visited there several times. We have record of at least two times, possibly more where he visited there. He knew these people well, he loved these people well, and this comes out in his letter. It's important to remember, this is a letter. We're reading other people's mail. So um, let's hear what Paul says to them and how he prays for them. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always and in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It's, it's right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For 
God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And then our last reading for today, the gospel reading, may be found in the gospel of Luke, chapter 6. Luke, chapter 6. Now, we normally, when we think of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, we normally think of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, but Luke also wrote an account of this teaching of Jesus. It's a shorter summary than what we have in Matthew, but you'll recognize many of the key points, even in the reading that you'll hear today. And the thing is, many of these teachings, as we've already alluded to, many of these teachings of Jesus are hard if we actually try to put them into practice, right, and take them seriously. Today's passage is among the most difficult to do that with, but that only makes it more important that we listen with open hearts to the words of our Lord. So listen to the word of the Lord from the Gospel of Luke, starting with verse 27. But I say to you who hear, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's the word of God for the people of God. We are continuing with our series of uh, sermons uh, around the prayers of Paul. And this one is titled Love, Knowledge, and Discernment. And you'll see why. Those are the key words I picked out um, very, very soon. And as we look at the Apostle Paul's prayers that he prayed, that he told us that he prayed, that he told them that he prayed for the churches that he served, here's one thing that has stood out to me. His prayers were always really about one thing, how Jesus will transform and shape them to bring glory to God. So transform and shape. Again, those are nice words to hear unless we're the one being transformed and shaped. It's not always pleasant or easy to be transformed and shaped, but this is what Paul is praying for his people. And so in this introductory portion of this letter that Paul is writing to this group of Jesus followers in Philippi, I, I think Paul's prayer really boils down to two things. The first one is this, that love 
would continue to grow in them. That love would continue to grow. And two, that this growing and increasing love would be intertwined with increasing knowledge and discernment. So we have love on one hand and knowledge and discernment on the other. And those are like two strands of a rope that are intertwined. That's, that's kind of how I envisioned it. So we have to ask, what exactly does Paul mean by love and knowledge and discernment? That's the whole thing kind of tips on those, those concepts. So let's, by, let's start by exploring the meaning of this word love because it's not as simple <laughs> as it seems. And we know that Paul wrote this letter in the Greek language, and we, many of you know, because you've been disciples of Jesus for a long time, that uh, Greek has many words for uh, love, and the word he is using here, I looked it up, is agape, agape, which is a word that many of you know. And you've heard me remark many times that in English, the word love is a pretty slippery word. We use it to mean a lot of different things. It can mean hunger or attraction or desire or affection or romance or sex or devotion or commitment. It's got a huge range of meaning depending on the context, depending on the setting in which we use it. Now, Greek has several different words where they kind of break out those meanings into different words, so it's a little more specific that way. But uh, agape is considered to represent what we might call the highest and deepest forms of love. More than just affection, more than just desire, but something much higher and better, more spiritual, if you will. But the context in which Paul is using the word here, agape, is even more specific. Because when Paul is talking about agape, when he's writing to Jesus followers, he means the kind of love that was taught and demonstrated in the life of Jesus, the Messiah. Does that make sense? His whole anchor point for his concept of what love is, is Jesus. Now, here's, here's what I want to point out about that particular context what did Jesus mean or what did Jesus show us about love? Jesus taught very clearly that the most full and complete expression of God's will for humans has also two intertwined manifestations. Again, like two strands of a rope. There's first the love for the God that made us, that we are to love God and that we are to love the humans around us. Right? You know that saying, love God with all your mind and heart and soul and strength, taken from the prayer called the Shema in, in Deuteronomy, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And it's not an either or. It's a both and. So Jesus taught that's what love looks like. And Jesus taught also that love is more than just a feeling of affection or fondness. He taught and demonstrated that genuine love, authentic love, will always manifest itself in action. Love is a choice that humans make to seek the well-being of people who are not you. <laughs> people other than yourself. Now, that concept kind of stands by itself. But Jesus, being Jesus, he takes that concept and extends it out even further because he also taught and demonstrated that love means seeking other people's well-being without expecting anything in return. That's hard. Especially from people who are in difficult situations, who cannot repay us, even if they wanted to. Take a moment. Who do you know? Who can you think of that fits that description? Just, yeah. So Jesus says, love that person. And then Jesus being Jesus, he doesn't leave that there. He extends that even further. 
teaching that the ultimate standard of authentic love, as we heard read from the gospel, is to love the person that you can't stand. Now, no, I put it that way, because I don't think we have that many superheroes here who have enemies, right? I don't think we have any, uh, you know, spies, right, who have enemies. But there are people that you can't stand, that rub you the wrong way. There are people that treat you badly, who have taken something from you, who have injured you or offended you in some way. To put it more in the words of Jesus, you shall love your enemy. Do good things for them and expect nothing in return. Who do you know who fits that description? Yeah, Jesus says, love that person. And of course, thank God, we know that Jesus not only taught this, he demonstrated it. For in telling the truth about the hypocrisy and corruption of the leaders of his people, he made them into his enemies. But instead of attacking his enemies to overthrow them through some political plot or military action, he allowed them to kill him. He gave himself over to them to kill him. Why? Because he loved them. The response of Jesus to selfishness and the corruption of his enemies was to die for them. This is why I said earlier, that's crazy talk. How can that accomplish anything? And yet this is the way that God chose to solve the problem of humanity's sin and rebellion. The power of God's love for the world isn't power the way we think of it at all. It is self-dying, self-sacrificing love. It turns out that such love isn't weakness. It turns out in God's eyes, in God's wisdom, that such love is ultimate power. That's something to meditate upon. And it's this kind of love, it's this kind of cruciform love, this kind of cross-shaped love that Paul is asking God to cause to grow and thrive and flourish and prol proliferate and overflow within that Jesus community in that city of Philippi. And I tell you, United Baptist Church, I'm pretty sure I have never met the Apostle Paul, but I'm pretty sure if he knew you, he'd pray that for you too. And so you know what? I pray that for you too. <laughs> and I would encourage you to be praying that for each other. Can you imagine what it would be like to be part of a community where that kind of love was the defining characteristic? Think about that for a moment. That would, of course, mean that you'd have to love that way too. <laughs> but to love that way and receive that kind of love, imagine what that would be like. Now, with that in mind, let's ask, what does Paul mean then by knowledge and discernment? It's, it's a little easier to talk about this. Uh, we can cover it pretty quickly. Knowledge is facts, information, data, stories, images, ideas, all that kind of stuff falls under the concept of knowledge. But here's the thing. In 21st century America, we know all about knowledge, don't we? We are swimming in knowledge. We are drowning in knowledge. Anybody feel like they're drowning in knowledge? Every once in a while these days. But our brain and our, and our brains are so constantly assaulted and overwhelmed by all this knowledge that some people, you know, we, we have to take pills and get counseling to deal with the stress and anxiety that all this knowledge creates. And you see, it's not about the amount of knowledge so much. It's really more about the kind of knowledge because there's knowledge that's good and there's knowledge that's bad. And that isn't just a matter of true and false, right? But it's also that some knowledge that is true is bad to know, <laughs> right? It's when we see something, we go, oh, I can't unsee that. I wish I could unsee that. I wish I could unhear that. And this is why Paul prays 
that love will grow and flourish with knowledge and discernment and discernment because discernment is the wisdom that helps us determine what's good knowledge and what's bad knowledge according to the way that God determines it. Knowledge and discernment have a purpose. And I took this from Michael Horton, who um, is a teacher and preacher who talks about how love intersects with knowledge and discernment and directs it along what he calls four coordinates. Four coordinates. Now, the first one is where we find that the knowledge of God, what God has revealed about himself, about his character, and his way of working in the Bible, what he's revealed in the Bible, we find first and foremost is a drama. It's a story. The Bible is a drama, a big story. Uh, and, and Christ is the beginning of that story. And Christ is the end of that story. And Christ is everything in between. It's a drama. That's the first coordinate. The second coordinate is out of that drama, as we read it carefully, and as the Spirit gives us light, we discern doctrine. It's not a bad word. Doctrine is a good word. And it simply means knowledge and facts and information about who God is and who we are and what God is doing for us in Jesus. That's good to know. Drama leads to doctrine. And as, we, as our knowledge and our understanding of the drama and the doctrine increase, it provokes us to doxology. Michael Horton's not even a Baptist, and they all fall in Ds. It's good, right? Uh, it focuses to doxology, or that's another fancy word for the worship of God. In other words, the drama and the doctrine, if we understand it rightly, it causes us to respond to God with love. And then together, these three coordinates give us a new way of living in the world as disciples. The drama, the doctrine, the doxology, and disciples. And it turns out, bringing it back around, that a large part of the life of, this, of the disciple, according to Jesus, is that we should love other people. With the same kind of self-sacrificing love that God lavished on you and me. Again, that's something to think about. But there's a why to this prayer. So that's the prayer. But then Paul goes on to tell us why he is praying that prayer. Paul has a purpose in mind for this prayer. That for love and knowledge and discernment, they're not ends in themselves. They don't stop there. But he has a, a purpose where he's going. So I'm going to kind of save time. I'm just going to give it to you from the Living Bible because they have a real, the Living Bible says it very succinctly. He says, first... The purpose for this prayer is that your growing love and your increasing knowledge and discernment will help you see clearly the difference between right and wrong. We live in a time of confusion where there's all kinds of voices telling us what's right and what's wrong, and most of them are wrong and they're bad. But God knows the way that's true. And as we grow in love, as love actually directs us to make our choices, love of God, love from God, the knowledge and discernment grow, we can choose what's right and what's wrong. Sometimes we're to do things not because they meet some kind of legal requirement or check off some box, but simply we're required to do them out of love. Consider that. Second, that love and knowledge and discernment will help us to remain inwardly clean so that no one will be able to criticize us from now until our Lord returns. It's like Paul wrote in Romans, who can condemn us when we're in Jesus Christ? Who can condemn us? Who, who stands up to accuse us when Christ has paid it all and made us clean? And third, that we will always be doing those good and kind things that show that we are in fact children of God. And fourth, this is the big one, the one toward which everything else ultimately aims. Do all of this, may all of this be true, so they will bring praise and glory to the Lord. That's the ultimate goal. Now, I read all of this as your pastor, and I want you to know that I pray for you, just like Paul prayed for the people that he 
brought the gospel to. And I pray, among other things, for your healing and for your health. And I do pray that you will be successful and prosperous in your work. And I do pray that your marriages and your family relationships and your work and friend relationships will be peaceful and full of joy. But I want you to note that as we go through this sermon series so far, and even as we go forward, that Paul never prays those kinds of things for his correspondents, or at least he doesn't tell them that's what he prays. He probably does. But that's not the top of mind thing that he writes down to tell them about. The goals of their prayers, are, of his prayers, are always that they would live lives that bring praise and glory to God. That's the main thing. And that this would be true regardless of their health, regardless of whether they're rich or poor or struggling or comfortable. If you read the rest of the book of Philippians, this letter, you'll see that's a theme that comes up again and again and again. Paul prays that the good news of Jesus would not be just another item of information swimming in a sea of information out there but detached from their lives. Paul prays that the drama of Christ's love as demonstrated when Jesus took on a human body and died for us on the cross. And the doctrine that describes his matchless grace and his infinite mercy, all of it undeserved, all of it just purely out of his love for us. Paul prays that that would penetrate, that truth would penetrate to the deepest places of our inner being and drive us to wholehearted worship of him, not just on Sundays, but every day. And to unreserved and wholehearted, obedient discipleship of him in every, every area of our lives. So I think this is what Paul meant. Tracking back just a few sentences. When he said, folks, I got to tell you, I am confident that God, God who began a good work in you, will keep right on helping you to grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished. On that day, when Jesus the Messiah returns. That work that work that God is doing within us, turns out it's about growing in God's love, in knowing God and his love, in discerning what is right. Does it really fall in line with God and his love? It turns out that love and knowledge and discernment help us to live lives of praise and glory to God. May this indeed be God's work right now today in you and in me. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may it be so. Amen.